Hi right, everybody, my name is Shosh, and actually my full name is Shosh Watamin, but that's fine. You guys can call me Sash, that's fine. A <laughs> um, couple of things, I work as a freelancer right now, and I actually study in uni, studied in Monash. Yeah. Anyways, let's get back to generative art. So, okay, let's see what Google has to say about this. Sounds cool. All right, cool. Uh, so when I usually, when I talk to people and when I mention generative art, this is what conjures up in their mind. A bunch of random images looking really cool. But what exactly is this? Essentially, this isn't really created by us. This is created by functions, programs, mathematics, sign, cause, things like that. Real boring stuff, actually, but they're actually producing really cool results. Anyways, um, so how do you use this? Thing is, right now, things like Canvas, SVG has grown so popular and we can actually use it in real time. So we can actually create things like this on the front end side. But thing is, when you actually create, like what's the end game? What's your goal? Why do you want to create it? And how would, you, how would it help you brand the website? The website you're making for your client, for your team, for your company, how would it help it. Anyways, I'll give you a couple of examples about how actually a couple of people, a couple of agencies went through creating generative art for their website. All right, cool. Um, show. All right, um, exhibit A, we got Harvard Law Review. Now, there is a agency in the States called Upstatement. Let's check them out. So these guys, they had this client, Harvard Law Review, and they were commissioned to make a website for them, a really new, really cool website. One thing is that, one thing is when they found out while interviewing the client that, all right, these guys, they don't actually use images and posts in their uh, articles. So the creative director was like, oh shit, this, um, this is confusing because if there are no images, it will look really bland. What, do you, what can we do to spice up the website? So, what they did was, they created 52 pieces of art. Now, can you see this part, the blue part? Now, check this out. Come on, load. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's pretty much it. So it actually changes, and the cool part is, um, the cool part is, all right, where's the back button? All right. So the cool part is, it's actually unique for each and every post. All right, so, uh, oh, and if you look at the footer, you can see the same image, but it is inverted. Anyways, what these guys did was, they use the title of the post, and they make a hash out of it. All right, and when they make a hash, they actually somehow, they jot the hash in a number between one to 52 right so each and every post will get a unique hash which will be located somewhere between 1 to 52 just think of it something like that like 1 to 52 and in the back end they've got 52 images right so they will be assigned a unique image based on the hash point being is that for each and every post there will be a unique image but that image will be unique for that post only so whenever they keep on scrolling when the users keep on scrolling for a new post a new image will be assigned to it. It's really cool because it actually gives an individuality to each and every post. Um, I feel like they could have done it front end, like the generative art part, but the thing is um, it could have some like unintended consequences. Or maybe um, the library by which they actually made the library by, by which they actually made the generative art could be really big. So maybe they didn't ship it in the front end. That could be my, like, that's my hypothesis. Anyways, that's a Harvard Law Review. Uh, exhibit B. Oh, perfect. 
you guys must have heard of signal versus noise. If you guys haven't heard of it, you guys are lying. Because the thing is, these guys, all right, um, just to recap, these guys, um, they were actual design agency sometime back in the 1990s, early 2000s. And they made Basecamp to manage their customers. And Basecamp became so popular, they actually, you know what, they're like, uh, you know what, this is really boring, web design, things like that. So we'll just keep managing Basecamp. And that's what happened. They became a product company. And while doing that, they actually made Ruby and Rails, which became real popular to document all their theories, everything. They actually made a blog called Signal versus Noise. Let's take a look at Signal versus Noise. And unfortunately, the thing about Signal versus Noise is that. Oh, Is that the actual move to Medium right now, medium.com. So I'm not really sure what's a scene behind Signal versus Noise. Like is the original blog still intact or not? Not really sure about that. Anyways, the cool part is that you look at this thing. This is really distinctive. Now, in a blogging system, you got different categories. Like um, for these guys, they have different categories like business and design, code, programming, things like that. What they did was they assigned a unique image, this thing, to the post, depending on which category it is in. Uh, when they're actually creating the blog, they actually went through a really, really big iterative process as in how to actually um, make the logo of the 37 de designs a signal versus blog, signal versus noise blog. And the it turns out that actually there's a meaning behind it. You see these waves, these waves actually they correspond to 37 signals. Something like that, that's the theory behind it. And the cool part is for business, they got like really, really smooth wave lines. And for design, they got like random wave lines. And it's really cool. Like if you take a look at their um, thinking, the way they made the whole, um, the different logos and everything, it's really cool. Now, a um, couple of things. So. All right, let's take a recap. What is generative art? Generative art is something which you can create with functions, uh, programming functions and things like that. How can it assist us? Well, it assists us in uh, making really good UXs. Now, if you take a look at this, it doesn't really add anything except that it looks really cool. The thing is, it has become so definitive. It has become a symbol for 37 signals this thing and the way the waveform is made it actually visualizes the categories the different categories that oh okay so business is like really serious so we'll have straight lines and if it's designed we'll have like random wavelengths it's really cool the way these guys thought about it so that's some ways you can make um, generative art like you really need to think behind it like you need to think about the process behind it Let's take a look at that. Uh, when I was researching this topic, I stumbled upon a couple of things. Uh, one is, when you're actually making generative art, it should be deterministic. Deterministic means, uh, let's see. So like, for example, you've got a function like, uh, make art. And say this function returns a base 64 image. So you need to pass something over here, like it could be a hash or it could be a string, something like that. The thing is, it should be unique, whatever you pass in, but unique as in the output should be the same. Have you guys played Age of Empires? Yep. Nice. <laughs> Anyways, um, if you remember Age of Empires 2, they had a random map generator. Yep. Yeah, and you enter a number or something, Perfect. So that's that's what you call a deterministic uh, function. A function, a deterministic function is essentially like you pass in something, some random junk, and it gives you some random junk. But you pass in the same random junk again, it gives you that same random junk again. That's what you call deterministic. You can determine that. So yeah, the number one thing is it should be deterministic. Whatever your generative art um, function is doing. Uh, there are a couple of things like there are a couple of uh, functions online, fun a couple of algorithms like Perlin noise. You can take a look into that, like the way um, you can generate noise. 
The second is I'll also give you a couple of links like, you know, how you got math.random in JavaScript. There's something, there's actually an NPM package which overwrites math.random with a deterministic function. So using that, you can actually make deterministic odd. Yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, second thing is it should visually aid the branding. Um, uh, who has read Jurassic Park? Excellent. All right, so if you, um, if you may have read the original version of Jurassic Park, the book, they had this thing, this, um, okay, so it's a bit hard to describe. They had grid lines, right? They had grid lines in the first chapter. And as the chapters went on, the grid lines, they, um, they were symmetrical in the beginning, but as the chapters went on, the grid lines became asymmetrical. Right? It became like random. And later on, as the chapters progressed, uh, images um, on the chapters, they became more random. Now, the point about Jurassic Park is not about dinosaurs, it's about Jeff Goldblum saying to everybody that, oh, shit, nature actually finds a way. That's the whole point, that's what it symbolizes that in the end nature finds a way and the way they describe it using the images is really awesome like the way they made the whole progression so you got something which is known like the grid system but that something becomes unknown as the chapters progresses and it's not actually generated well, it is but not exactly but the way they use it it's really good something it's just something like an idea, something which you can use in your designs. Oh, and the last part is, anyways, um, it shouldn't be in your face. Uh, one thing I've seen is that all these generative art experiments, which people use in the life sites, they aren't really like, guys, look, we made something really cool, you should check it out. It's not like that. It's more like it's really subtle. Only repeating users, they may be able to notice this. But when they notice, they're like, oh, that's awesome. It's really cool. So, yeah, that's, that's something. Uh, some guidelines. If the code to generate audits is too big, generate it either on the server or pre-generated. Um, yeah, so one thing you can do is you can actually use AI to generate art server side and just name the art files as one dot jpeg, two dot jpeg. And in the front end, you know, just like map the value, like the hash value between some numbers, two numbers. That's what Upstatement did for Harvard Law Review. The second thing is, um, there is a thing called Caro, which is basically Canvas. You can use Canvas in Node.js. So take a look into that, it's really cool. Ask for user feedback if the art is too obvious, turn it down, or obviously just remove it. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything except add a couple of kilobytes to your website. Um, you're using it for UX, so it should be, you should be able to use it for UX. And if it is not doing its work, you should remove it, unfortunately. Optionally, it would be really good if the art supported the UX in some way. Actually, I can give you an example. So this is... Well, never mind. It's too slow. Yeah, but that's pretty much it. Like a couple of ideas that, and there are also a couple of things that people have made uh, in live websites using generative art, and it's really cool. It's a really nice uh, niche um, um, thingy. Uh, yeah, I think as developers, uh, sorry, as designers, you should take a look into it. It's really cool. Anyways, there are a couple of resources uh, supplied along, uh, case studies, uh, code. There's this guy called a Matt, uh, I forgot his name, anyways. He makes some really cool generative art in Node.js and Canvas using Cairo. Uh, this is also really cool, Nature of Code. So it's about machine learning, genetic programs, and things like that. Also a couple of other resources like Reddit, <laughs> Creative AI. <yeah. laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Any questions?